Friday, January 16th, 2024 at 9.30 a.m. Donald Trump's next trial begins. This is in the E. Jean Carroll other defamation trial. This for statements Donald Trump made in 2019 while he was disgracing his office. Donald Trump was already found liable by a jury in a previous E. Jean Carroll case for sexual abuse and defamation back in May. A $5 million judgment was entered against Trump then. And in this upcoming trial, it is all about damages against Donald Trump for those 2019 defamatory statements and lots of damages indeed. Per usual, Donald Trump tried desperately to delay trial, including invoking the death of his mother-in-law, despite the fact that that ain't stopping him from going around the country and attacking prosecutors and doing all the other things that he's doing. But Donald Trump unable to delay trial. It starts this week. Trump is now on to the wine and threaten stage of the predictable behavior we've seen. Closing arguments were held in the New York civil fraud case last week after 11 weeks and 44 days of trial. Donald Trump wanted to give part of the closing argument himself, but originally would not agree to follow the rules that every other lawyer and litigant must follow. Despite being told if you're not going to follow the rules, then you can't give a closing statement. That didn't stop Donald Trump from jumping in during the closing statements and giving one of the most unhinged and bizarre performances ever. And then storming out of the courtroom and running to uh, one of the properties he has an interest in at 40 Wall Street, which is also the site of of the fraud that's being alleged in that civil fraud lawsuit. Justice Arthur Ngoron said he expects to deliver a ruling by January 31st. Then we're going to go to Washington, D.C., where oral arguments were held earlier in the week in the federal criminal case involving Trump's attempt to overthrow the results of the 2020 election. Donald Trump's lawyers argued that absolute immunity means that Donald Trump could directly order the SEAL Team 6 to kill political opponents, and there would be no criminal consequences unless he was impeached by the House, convicted by the Senate, and he would be granted absolute total immunity for engaging in conduct like that later in the week, including at this bizarre press conference Donald Trump held after closing arguments concluded in the New York Attorney General civil fraud case. Donald Trump reiterated that, yes, indeed, he believes that he has the power to order SEAL Team 6 to kill political operative, political opponents, and he would receive absolute immunity for that. Finally, we're going to go to Florida, the Southern District, uh, Florida District Court, where Judge Eileen Cannon in the Mar-a-Lago document case where Trump's being charged with willful retention of national defense information. Judge Cannon continues to just butcher her docket and the law. She's invented her own procedures at this point under the Classified Information Procedure Act rather than following what the statute makes very clear she's supposed to do. She's also denied without prejudice the government's fairly standard request that Donald Trump or any criminal defendant in that position disclose if they will be making an advice of counsel defense, which just means a blame your lawyer defense uh, before trial. Uh, Judge Cannon says requiring Donald Trump to do this at this stage is premature. Well, she uses the term premature. Trial's four months away based on her nonsensical scheduling order set to start on May 20th of 2024. Folks, this is Legal AF. I'm Ben Micellis, of course, joined by my co-host, Michael Popak. A very eventful week indeed, Michael Popak. And I just want to start off by just showing you the stakes right here. And this is why you and I do this show and why it's so important that we promote a literacy in our legal system, because this is exactly what Donald Trump is trying to create. And this is what Trump posted this morning. He goes, thank you to Sammy the Bull. I hope judges and Goron and Kaplan see this. We need fairness, strength, and honesty in our New York courts. We don't have it now. Donald Trump citing Sammy the Rat Gravano, a murdering psychopath, former underboss for the Gambino crime family, 
who admitted to killing in cold blood at least 19 people, including his closest friend and brother-in-law. Trump is citing him as a character witness in his court cases that we are talking about and using it as a way to threaten, no doubt, the judges and our judicial system. This is what we are dealing with, not from a both sides perspective. It's coming just from one side, and it is a shameful thing to see. But I want to get into that because it's why evidence, admissible evidence, our judicial system following the rules is so important. Popak, how are you, sir? I'm, <laughs> I'm doing great. It's a great lead in. Yeah, anytime you're citing um, a mob boss who was in witness, witness protection, and killed 20 people as your character reference, you're, it's probably, I don't know what a constituency of your base you're appealing to there, those that are in witness protection or want to be. Um, and I went back, and though there's a hot take, well, I'll do, I won't, I won't do it here. There's a hot take that I've done. I went back to the clip of Sammy the Bull Gravato, who has a podcast, not on our network, thank God, um, commenting about Donald Trump. And even there, it's not a favorable comment about Donald Trump. He didn't say that he's incorruptible, which is what Donald Trump wants that to say. What he said was that Donald Trump has a mafia organized crime-like cocoon around him in the 1980s and 1990s because of his father's money combined with ex-FBI agents that were protecting him, and he couldn't get to him. That's different than I got to him, he wouldn't take a bribe. That's much different. So if you're going to cite Sammy the Bull Gravano for some sort of uh, moral character reference, at least get it right. Look, the leading candidate for the Republican Party on at least 48 state ballots, this, <laughs> this last week alone is facing a $400 million or more verdict or judgment by a judge who's going to finally lay waste to the lie that Donald Trump is a successful real estate mogul without having perpetrated persistent fraud in all of his operations over the last 10 years as he comes up on a trial, not the trial that we all want here on Legal AF, not the criminal trial, but another civil trial, very important, especially to the victim and to justice, about him raping and then defaming. And it's not another defamation case as the press has reported it. It is a punitive damage case only. Liability has already been established in Eugene Carroll. So he faces that this week with his lawyers as the D.C. Court of Appeals um, basically performed, especially led by Judge Pan, and we'll talk about later, performed, uh, performed basically on the air uh, live autopsy of John Sauer, the, the lawyer for Donald Trump, ripping out his heart and showing it to him based on questioning that went searingly right to the heart of the illogic of their multiple arguments strung together to try to argue that Donald Trump had immunity from criminal prosecution and should have his indictment dismissed. All that and so much more <laughs> on this episode of Legal AF. Love the imagery, Michael Popak. And here's <laughs> a simple way to think about uh, who's winning or losing in these various Donald Trump cases. Donald Trump's always losing, okay? Um, <laughs> other than before Judge Eileen Cannon, but there has not been a final resolution, obviously, of that matter yet. And later in this episode, I'll tell you what I think is going to be happening there. I mean, he's prevailed in these procedural uh, skirmishes where Judge Eileen Cannon is desperately trying to avoid making any order and trying to delay the proceedings because she knows she's going to get immediately reversed by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals as soon as she makes her first substantive order. Think about this, Michael Popak. We're recording this on January 13th, Saturday, and Judge Eileen Cannon in that case, on a very simple case, did Donald Trump steal the documents? Did he willfully possess these documents? Did he fail to return them? That's the case. She's failed to make a substantive order, just issuing these paperless scheduling orders because she's learned all the wrong lessons from when she was previously overturned by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals because she issued an order there too soon. And the 11th Circuit said, no, you are doing something here that no judge in the history of America has ever done. One of the most scathing reversals I have ever read. So her lesson is, nah, should I do the right thing? No. Let me just do the wrong thing, but let me just delay the inevitable. But that is one of the MOs of Trumpism, right? Delay, delay, delay the inevitable. Compound and make matters worse. 
And that's what Donald Trump has always tried to do. But your simple chart is if Donald Trump is the one doing the suing, if he's the plaintiff, he will lose. Donald Trump suing Michael Cohen, loser. Um, and Donald Trump dismissed his own case because he was afraid to have his deposition taken. The case this week that we talked about in one of the hot takes where Donald Trump previously sued New York Times and tried to get around New York's anti-slap statute by not pleading defamation, but trying to call it tortious interference with contractual relations. Another Alina Haba specialty, Donald Trump hit with $400,000 in attorney's fees. Donald Trump sues Hillary Clinton. Alina Haba, Donald Trump sanctioned nearly a million dollars for filing a meritless lawsuit. And then on the defense side, whether it's civil or criminal, the Trump organization, Donald Trump continuing to lose and lose and lose. And that brings us to the E. Jean Carroll case, which you previewed, Michael Popak, because Donald Trump's already lost. He lost in the May trial. He was already found to have sexually abused, which Judge Kaplan, the federal judge, makes clear is the same thing in New York as rape. It's a technical difference in the statute, but in a recent order and in previous orders, Judge Kaplan says, no, you were found to have raped E. Jean Carroll by a jury and defamed her back in May. There's a doctrine called collateral estoppel, which says that the jury findings basically transfer to a new trial. So already the same, there's the same claim, same types of statements, not a sexual abuse uh, claim in this new trial coming up. Um, but these are based on statements that Trump made in 2019. The other case involves statements made in 2022 and the underlying sexual abuse based on the Adult Survivors Act. But this case got delayed a little bit per Donald Trump's delay because Bill Barr tried to substitute the United States in place to Donald Trump and that ended up backfiring so that it went ultimately to this trial. So that's why this one, even though it was filed first and it's technically Carol one, is going to trial second next week. Um, but here we are now at a trial purely about damages. And Popak, Donald Trump wants to make this case about anything but damages. So he's tried to introduce, you know, he's trying to introduce all this other stuff. E. Jean Carroll's brilliant lawyers, led by Roberta Kaplan, know exactly what he's trying to do. Trump says he's going to show up. And E. Jean Carroll's lawyers have been filing all of these documents, making sure it's very clear the rules of what this trial is, the limitations of this trial. Um, Donald Trump uh, continuing to try to delay this. Again, he cites that his mother-in-law's death is the reason. But tell us, where are we right now, Michael Popak, with, uh, with what Donald Trump can and can say because of the prior rulings and what this case is about. How impactful is that going to be? Is Trump going to show up? What what can we expect from this trial, Michael Popak? Yeah, it's um, Robbie Kaplan in her letter briefing that we've been really following very closely. And we've had Robbie on the show before to talk about matters. Um, they're really concerned and they're getting the judge's attention with what Trump is going and his lawyers I'll talk about those lawyers in a minute, who they are, who they aren't, are going to try to do at the trial. The trial is only about uh, the amount of damages, punitive, that E. Jean Carroll suffered, just to prove that, based on the defamation that the jur jury will be told to assume, they'll be instructed by the judge, that the judge has already determined that there's been defamation, malice. Um, against E. Jean Carroll by Donald Trump while he was president in the statements that he made, which were, and there are, they are to, the, they will be instructed to assume for the purposes of all of their deliberation that the, the defamation happened. Now, and they're only there, the sole purpose of them being there is on the punitive damages. That's why I called it a punitive damage case. That's the headline. It's not a, and tens of millions of dollars are at risk against Donald Trump. Donald Trump and his lawyers, Alina Haba, Again, we'll talk about her throughout today's podcast, and not for good reasons. And and uh, Medayo, who had been Donald Trump's original lawyers in the first E. Jean Carroll case, but had so screwed the pooch and screwed that case up time and time again, including failing to raise presidential immunity as a possible defense, having that ultimately waived, failing on basic issues of evidence in that case involving the DNA of 
the coat dress that uh, Miss Carroll was wearing on the day of the attack. Elena Haba screwed that up, and the, no DNA evidence was ever allowed to be introduced into evidence at the case. She screwed up her other experts, and experts were barred and banned from testifying in the first case. Um, this is all the screw ups of Elena Haba, and she, she did it so often and, and so spectacularly that even Donald Trump broke up with her, to paraphrase um, Karen Freeman Ignifilo, our colleagues, uh, one of our colleagues, and fired her effectively from being lead trial counsel 90 days before the first trial. That, start, that started and ended in May over the summer. They replaced, them, replaced her with Joe Tacopina. Joe Tacopina did no better, did probably a lot worse, especially how he cross-examined so ham-fistedly and, and, uh, and terribly, roughly, in front of a jury, E. Jean Carroll herself, the victim. And, and there was a big loss for Donald Trump there. But now Alina Hobb is back. And in the conversations that she's had with the lawyer for E. Jean Carroll, it's become clear that they think they're able to retry the entire case again. Uh, this is a case that Donald Trump, the first time, didn't bother to appear in, never, never showed up at all. That's what I call Trump 1.0. He's learned since then he shouldn't stay away. Um, he should come and, and do ma maximum collateral damage, whether inside the courtroom or just outside the courtroom, rather than not show up at all. But he didn't show up. He didn't testify, despite threats that he was going to. And now they've dropped the lawyers for, for um, E. Jean Carroll. Now, Haba and Madayo back have told Robbie Kaplan, the lawyer for E. Jean Carroll, that Donald Trump is likely to testify. In fact, he only had two witnesses that he thought were going to testify. Carol Martin, formerly a CBS news reporter, local for uh, New York that I used to She's very beloved. People loved Carol Martin, who was an outcry witness in the first trial, a special status type of witness that uh, is used when you have a hearsay statement, even of the, the victim, but it's said almost spontaneously or contemporaneously with a terrible event. And that witness is given sort of special class in our evidence, our evidence presentation, because it's said if somebody cries out and somebody hears it, then there's a special quality of credibility that goes along with that. And Carol Martin was one of the two people that E. Jean Carroll called the night of the attack in spring of 1996 in the um, uh, uh, Bergdorf Goodman department store dressing room when she was, as the jury determined, uh, technically raped under New York law um, or uh, sexually abused, but effectively raped, as the judge has said time and time again in his orders. So Donald Trump had her on the list and all said he's going to testify. And then through commentary that they had in the meet and confer process that lawyers have to have in advance of filing motions, it became clear that they thought they were going to, the, the Trump side thought they're going to try the whole case again. Let's put her E. Jean Carroll through the mill again on her sexual background and her conduct and her relationship with her husband and statements that she made here, there, and the other place. And uh, let's just try that case again. And the judge said, you're not trying that case again. That case is over. This is about damages. Nothing that you're telling me about the things that you want to say about E. Jean Carroll and her credibility or her DNA or her of her code or who she spoke to or how many CNN episodes she went on doesn't matter in terms of the damage of the jury will have to assess. It's not probative, meaning it doesn't tend to prove or disprove a fact that's relevant to the case. And so the E. Jean Carroll's lawyers bring it to the attention of the judge in a series of motions, two of which we'll talk about here. One is, judge, don't let them in front of a jury. We saw the acting out already, and it's detailed uh, specifically in a recent motion that was just filed by E. Jean Carroll's lawyers, Donald Trump just made a shambles and chaos of the civil fraud case, doing exactly what we fear with good reason he'll do here. He's going to ignore your orders, Judge Kaplan, where you've already ruled on summary judgment that defamation has been established, just like he ignored the orders of Judge Angoron right next door in New York State Court. He's going to stand up and start attacking and violating your, your rules about what can and can't be said. And you have to do something about it because we have a jury that needs to be protected. That motion about Donald Trump's appearance either – sitting in the courtroom and blurting out things or doing it out in the hallway near the jury or taking the stand, he needs to be disciplined and guardrails have to be put up according to, the, and I agree with it, uh, E. Jean Carroll's lawyers, 
um, before this jury even comes into the room and before evidence is even presented to them in opening statement. And if you don't do it, look what just happened across the street, Judge, just recently. That's still pending. I expect that there's going to be a ruling very, very soon, maybe right off the podcast, uh, where the judge is going to grant that. He's already granted a order a motion and issued an order that details exactly what what can and cannot be argued or said in the courtroom. Anything that goes to liability, whether she's, you know, her credibility and who's paying the freight for her lawsuit, whether any of the costs are being defrayed by a by a political action group or some sort of litigation funding group, um, the DNA of her dress, um, any of her statements that have nothing to do with damages. All are not coming in. That's just the judge reminding Alina Haba what this case is about. Now, the problem with that, Ben, and I'll turn it over to you. The problem with that is Alina Haba, how do I put this nicely, is not a tremendous, um, she doesn't have a tremendous ability to properly uh, both take in information and transmit it properly. What I mean by that is, Let's take her recent performance in her clo- part of the closing argument of the New York Attorney General case. She spent a fair amount of time in front of the judge talking about Letitia James, the New York Attorney General, having a Starbucks cup of coffee in the room and potentially taking off her shoes at a certain point to rub her foot. This seems to be where Alina Hobbs' head is out, thinking she's scoring some sort of points for I don't know what audience in trying to attack uh, Letitia James. That is the same person that this very delicate case of a, of a rape victim already established by jury and judge in front of a new jury, federal jury, to decide punitive damages. I mean, talk about a bull in a china shop. So this judge is going to have to be on high alert about what this this unscrupulous, I'll just call it for what it is, legal team on the other side that knows no boundaries and is not tethered to the rules of ethics or conduct or laws and what they do in front of a jury. The number one thing here, Ben, is that this jury be protected, not just because we need that, that E. Jean Carroll's entitled to have a jury that's properly uh, not afraid of making decisions and isn't nullified, their decision-making isn't nullified, but Donald Trump too. I mean, this is for the justice system. This is for the, even though it's civil, the, the the entire court system being protected and this jury. What he does in acting out and telling Judge Angoron, the New York civil fraud judge, off to his face and 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 laughing, and that's that's one thing. That's bad enough. I would refer them to the bar if I were the judge. But in front of a jury, things have to be taken seriously. And Judge Kaplan's the judge to do it based on his prior rulings. You ask which audience, somewhat rhetorically, which is the audience of right-wing media that does not want to consume the evidence, or maybe they do want to consume it, but they are used to being fed a diet of complete and absolute crap where Alina Haba goes on these shows and they talk to her about, you know, how great is it to be so pretty and attractive? And how do you think that works with your legal skills or the lack thereof? And she talks about that. I like being attractive. I was asked, you know, if you'd rather be pretty or smart. And I've said, I'd rather be pretty because you can fake smart. I, I mean, that's what she's saying on these right wing media channels when she goes and, and, and speaks to them. But that's why evidence and facts matter. You know, for example, Donald Trump will whine and say, the, and he has when he did that so called CNN, uh, back when he did the CNN town hall, when he did the recent so called Fox town hall, when he's giving his speeches and talking about Eugene Carroll, when Donald Trump on his own brings up, and they won't let me talk about the dress, the dress, the dress. Well, in a very detailed order, the judge explained that for basically two to three years, you could have turned over your DNA sample and there could have been a test that was done. You chose to waive that by not turning over your DNA sample. And then on the eve of the last trial, you wanted to make some deal and have some negotiation. Hey, I'll agree to turn over a DNA sample if you agree to turn over, you know, some of the uh, some of the kind of DNA test swabs that you've previously done on the dress. And that's not the way it works. You had ample time to turn over the sample and you've refused to do that. And you've waived the opportunity. That's, you've a, Hava. Waived- that's a Hava screw up. 
Similarly, you've waived putting an expert in because you didn't disclose it. You've waived the deadline of challenging E. Jean Carroll's expert because you didn't you didn't do it on time. And going into the judge's order, I mean, this is such a powerful statement right here, where the judge says this: the jury in Carroll too found by a preponderance of evidence that Mr. Trump sexually abused Ms. Carroll and injured her in doing so. Two, his conduct was willfully negligent or reckless in doing so, or he acted with a conscious disregard for Ms. Carroll's rights. And three, Ms. Carroll was entitled to compensatory and punitive damages for sexual abuse of $2.2 million. Consequently, the fact that Mr. Trump was sexually abused in the fact that Mr. Trump sexually abused, indeed raped Miss Carroll, has been conclusively established and is binding in this case. I mean, think about that line. Consequently, the fact that Mr. Trump sexually abused, indeed raped Miss Carroll, has been conclusively established and is binding in this case. And so I know we're talking about a lot of cases and what do you think is going to happen at the next E. Jean Carroll case? What do you think is going to happen at the New York Attorney General civil fraud case where New York Attorney General Letitia James is asking for at least $370 million plus 9% compounding interest, which can take that up to the $500 million range. But we're seeing a federal judge say the leader of the Republican Party has been conclusively found to have raped somebody. Like, I don't want to lose track of, of what that statement is. And now we have a trial that is taking place um, next week that starts on this issue right here about the damages that are being caused by Donald Trump's defamation. And from the punitive damages perspective, his continuing to torment his victim and that he needs to be punished for doing it. That is what is happening now. And as you and I have said, before February 1, before February 1, there will likely be somewhere in the range of 250 million to 500 million, maybe even more in damages, in judgments, hard judgments against Donald Trump with these two cases. And we'll talk in a moment how Justice Ngoron has said that he expects his order to issue on uh honor before january 31st popak i want to get one last comment one last comment on that the the same expert who testified for damages for ruby uh, ruby freeman and shea moss leading to 148 million dollars against rudy giuliani is the same expert that will be testifying alone without any counter expert by donald trump because of another alina hombus screw up in the trial this coming week and so the new number for me uh is reset Whereas the jury in May gave uh, E. Jean Carroll for what happened then, $5 million, $5.5 million, including punitive damages. That Those numbers are, are, are way off based on how he, like you said, relentlessly continues to go after. The punitive damage number here will be tens of millions of dollars, maybe approaching $100 million. It's Professor Humphreys over at Northwestern University, a reputational damages expert who will be testifying, and we will be covering that here on Legal AF and the Midas Touch Network. When we come back, we'll talk about what's happened at the closing argument in the New York Attorney General civil fraud case. We'll talk about uh, oral arguments in the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, and what in the world is Judge Eileen Cannon doing? Well, she's just pulling a cannon. We'll be back after this quick break. Did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you wake up too hot or too cold, I highly recommend you check out Miracle Maid's bed sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Maid uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. Using silver infused fabrics inspired by NASA, Miracle Maid sheets are thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long. So you get better sleep every night. These sheets are infused with silver that prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresh three times longer than other sheets. 
No more gross odors. Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and feel as nice, if not nicer, than sheets used by some five-star hotels. Miracle sheets are the perfect gift for your spouse, friends, or family who doesn't want better sleep and luxurious feeling bed sheets. And since these come with three free towels, you get two gifts in one, just in time for the holidays. Stop sleeping on bacteria. Bacteria can clog your pores, causing breakouts and acne. Sleep clean with Miracle. Go to trymiracle.com slash legal AF to try it today or gift it to someone special this holiday season. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Save over 40%. And if you use our promo legal AF at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash legalaf and use the code legalaf to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash legalaf to treat yourself, a friend, or loved one this holiday season. What's more important than sleep? It's the foundation of our mental and physical health. And when you're sleeping well, you can perform at your best in every way. Proper sleep can also increase focus, boost your energy, and improve your mood. Introducing Beam's Dream Powder. It's a science-backed, healthy, hot cocoa for sleep. If you know me, you know that Dream has been a game changer for my sleep. Sometimes I find myself up at night in bed with thoughts, uneasiness, going on my phone. Well, that was the case until I started drinking Beam's Dream Powder. Prior to this Dream Powder, the poor sleep and late nights staying up affected my mood and affected my energy, but not anymore. And today our listeners get a special discount on Beam's Dream Powder, their science-backed healthy hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar. It's now available in many different delicious flavors. It's really good, like chocolate peanut butter, cinnamon, cocoa, and sea salt caramel with only 15 calories and zero grams of sugar. Better sleep is never tasted better. And other sleep aids can sometimes make you feel groggy the next day, take it from me. I have tried them and they do, but Dream it contains a powerful all-natural blend of reishi, magnesium, L-theanine, and melatonin and nano CBD to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. The numbers don't lie. In clinical study, 93% of participants reported that Dream helped them get better sleep. Beam Dream is easy to add to your nighttime routine. Just mix it in hot water or milk, froth, and enjoy it before bed. Find out why Forbes and New York Times are all talking about Beam and why it's trusted by the world's top athletes and business professionals. If you want to try Beam's best-selling dream powder, get up to 40% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash legal AF and use legal AF as a code at checkout. That's shopbeam.com slash legal AF and use legal AF, uh, the code, when you check out for up to 40% off. Well, that was a treat right there. We got Karen Friedman Agnifilo, even though she's not hosting the weekend edition, to see the KFA ad right there. It was great to see her on the show. KFA, we see you in the chat as well as as always. And uh, she's beam dreaming. What'd you say? <laughs> she's beam dreaming during the chat. Beam, beam dreaming. And who was... Not beam dreaming, but may have been beaming a bunch of nonsense. Nice little smooth transition Good. there. I defeated like by calling out the transition <laughs> is Alina Haba, Good. Donald Trump, during their closing arguments before the New York Attorney General and the New York Attorney General civil fraud case. Justice Ngoron, of course, is the judge presiding over this matter. It was an 11 week, 44 days of trial, but really three years when you include include the investigation itself that led to the lawsuit that was filed back in late September of 2022 that brought us to this moment. And that's why covering this every step of the way, Michael Popak, to get to that closing argument and then to get to that 
uh, judgment that Justice Ngoron has promised that will likely take place before January 31st. I think it shows everybody out there how the law works. If you've been following Legal AF in this network from the outset, we've been going through every single step of this proceeding. And the last step, of course, is this closing argument. So first up in the closing arguments was the defense. Then the New York Attorney General gave their closing argument. Um, before closing argument took place, Donald Trump again tried to delay these proceedings the same way he tried to delay the E. Jean Carroll case. And he said that his mother-in-law's passing was one of the reasons why he wanted a delay, but that hasn't stopped him from holding so-called town halls on Fox and doing a bunch of other things. Donald Trump, through his lawyer, Christopher Keist, said Trump wanted to give the closing argument or part of it. Uh, wrote an email to Judge Ngoron requesting that in in New York, you, you send emails to the you know send emails to the judges, but they get docketed eventually on the docket as as formal correspondence. And Judge Ngoron basically to to kind of shorten it was like, yeah, okay, and I have the discretion not to allow it. It's against the law <laughs> under New York if you are represented by counsel to give your own closing argument. You could fire your lawyers, proceed what's called pro per and then give your own closing argument. That's fine. But otherwise here, you know, I have the discretion to decide whether or not you're going to give the closing argument because it's prohibited conduct. But in my discretion, I'll allow Donald Trump to give the closing argument. Just here's the thing. Trump has to just state that he will agree to follow the rules, that he will follow the same rules that you, the lawyers, have to follow, that any litigant in this court. He can't go on random rants attacking the prosecutors, personalities, or saying things about my law clerk. If he sticks to the facts and evidence and gives a normal closing, I'm okay with that happening in my courtroom. Then Donald Trump's lawyers said that's unfair. I don't know why that would be unfair. That's unfair to Donald Trump. He wants to go by his own set of rules. So Judge Goran said, then no, I'm not allowing it. And then Trump and everybody on his legal team whined. They're stopping him from speaking. They're gagging him again. They're not letting him speak, you know, and it's just like, come on. He said, you can do it. Just just follow the rules that every other American has to follow when they're in a court uh, of law. Then you had the closing arguments take place. Popak, I want to get your thoughts of what went down. But, you know, before getting to the Trump part, which I'll throw to you and your overall take, I mean, Alina Haba's argument was in addition to trying to mock New York Attorney General Letitia James for holding a Starbucks coffee and for the way she was sitting on her chair, which the judge cut off. Habba said, we're all just human beings here. And, and Donald Trump did his best. Any of the things that the New York Attorney General's office are saying is fraud, that's human error. And he was just trying as hard as he can. That was one of Alina Habba's main argument. She said, explain to me, if you're trying to commit fraud, why would you put the fraud in writing? Why would you send it to other real estate agents as though people don't commit fraud in writing? And then her other point was, why would they hire one? Why would the Trump organization hire one of the largest accounting firms in the state of New York, Mazers, which I don't even think they are one of the largest accounting firms, but they're a big accounting firm. Why would they hire one of the largest accounting firms if they were going to commit fraud? Like, okay, Enron hired every big accounting firm. So did Bernie Madoff. People who com who hire accounting firms still commit fraud. Those were her arguments. And then the New York Attorney General's office was like, you did not hear anything there to rebut the fact that their numbers were wrong. They did not argue ever that they provided correct valuations. What they argued is that based on their own subjective valuation methodology, that they think that they that their numbers, which are completely off, are correct. But your honor, as we've said time and time again, what they neglect is not the valuation methodology. The fraud is the writing. It is the inputs that go into the valuation methodology. So when you lie and commit fraud and say Mar-a-Lago, which is a commercial club, is a 
uh, residential property and value it as a residential property with no encumbrances on it, that's fraud. When you say your triplex is 30,000 square feet and it's 10,000 square feet, that is a fraud. When you say your buildings are fully leased out, fully occupied at the highest price per square foot, but they are actually rent controlled and they're not fully leased, the input, the data that you put into the valuation model and methodology, no matter which model you use, will be false because it has fraudulent data in it. And when Alina Habba says we're human beings and they just did their best, that is not a defense. And Popak, those are just the cold, hard facts that we have to stick to, right? Ben, you're being so unreasonable that your case against Donald Trump is based on facts and evidence and not on Starbucks coffee cups and whether the Letitia James kicked off her heels at some point. How dare you? Um, there's a salty put back the um, the the clip of when the report the camera is allowed to be in the courtroom for the very beginning. L look at the facial expressions on the lawyers, Chris Keis to Donald Trump's right on our left, Alina Haba. Um, that's Cliff Robert on the far end of the table. Chris Keis looks like he's got a secret. He looks like he's a Cheshire cat, a little Cheshire cat smile. What he does, what he knows is at the end of his at when, uh, end of his version of the closing, because they split the closing up and Chris Keis was the main lawyer, Alina Habba did another part of it, that he was going to, at the end, he was going to ask the judge once again if he could um, allow Donald Trump to speak. Now, as you noted, and I one one point of clarification: You don't normally email your judge in New York. What happened is that the uh, principal law clerk, Allison Greenberg, doing her job, uh, back to what she does actually does for a living, she wrote to the parties right off the holiday and said, "Okay, let's get back to uh, the scheduling issues. Our courtroom is being used by another case by the New York Attorney General because she can walk and chew gum at the same time, unlike Alina Haba. She's trying the case of the National Rifle Association uh, fraud case in that same courtroom. I don't think it's with Judge Angoran, but in the same courtroom. So she's just doing some logistics. Hey, everybody, uh, we're gonna, we're, you know, the courtroom is gonna be a little differently arranged. How much time does everybody need? And you know, somebody asked, uh, "Are we going to do the? Are we going to do it the old-fashioned way, where the defendant goes first and the plaintiff goes second? We flip it for closing, and who's going to be arguing and that kind of thing?" To which um, the lawyers for the attorney general, you know, properly responded, "We we need an hour. It's going to be a split between me and another, you know, special prosecutor, a counsel for this." And then Chris Keis goes completely, you know, um, cuckoo crazy down another a rabbit hole. He leads, I love when he leads in the email to the principal law clerks before the judge jumps on and says, Happy New Year, Allison. Allison, this is the woman, the person who's been mercilessly, misogynistically bashed by Donald Trump, Alina Hobb, and Chris Keis from day one arguing that she's a co-judge, that she's a hack, a democratic hack, she's partisan, leading to threat levels going up against her exponentially, uh, people wanting to kill, mutilate her, and worse. Happy New Year. Um, sure, you know, we're going to, that's fine, and this and that. And by the way, we want Donald Trump, he literally writes this in his email, and we think Donald Trump is going to, he's going to get part of the closing. Like, sorry? <laughs> Without any citation to any case law that allows that or supports that, because it doesn't, um, that, you know, people think, is that unusual? Yeah, that's really unusual. That doesn't happen, Okay. You know, he had his chance to speak twice. He only took one of those two opportunities. He got subpoenaed to testify against his interests, cross-examination style, in the case in chief for the New York Attorney General. But then when he had his chance to just get softballs thrown to him by, a, I would imagine, Alina Haba to talk about what a great, sexy real estate mogul you are, he passed as we, you and I predicted, that he did not show up despite threatening on the campaign trail, I'm going to testify. No, you're not. And you didn't. And that was your opportunity in your case in chief to say what you wanted to say, you know, within, within limits, under oath. Now, when the issue of Donald Trump came up, then the New York Attorney General jumped in with case law that said you can't do that. Yes, it's in the court's discretion, but the discretion should be not exercised in favor of it. Don't do it, judge. And if you do it, it's got to be like on very strict orders about what he can and can't do in this courtroom. And the judge also mindful that it's just him. There's no jury present. I think did some things that are unusual that I he probably regrets having done. 
he gave, he jumped onto the chain and he said, I have discretion. I think it's important. If he wants to speak and he can do it the right way, this is what I liked about the judge. It just shows that he's no bias. He just wants everything in. He said, I think it could be helpful to the trier of fact, which is me, to hear from the person who's most impacted by my ultimate ruling. So sure, it's unusual, but I'll allow it as long as he plays nice in the sandbox and colors inside the lines and acts like a lawyer. If he acts like a lawyer, maybe not his lawyer, but if he acts like a lawyer, normal lawyer, he can speak. Now, what I would have done, and I said this on a hot take is, I would have said, and he's under oath and he needs to be sworn in under oath. A lawyer gets the benefit as an officer of the court to give argument that's considered argument um, without having to be sworn, but not this guy. So this guy should be under oath. I would have done that. He didn't do that. And instead, they went back and forth in, in, in minutes apart about the issue. And Chris Kai it's unfair. My guy needs to f- uh, freely speak. He had the opportunity to freely speak about anything wide ranging. You're gagging him and all the rest. And the judge said, take it or leave it. If he wants to speak, this is it. And I said on the Wednesday podcast with, with Karen Freeman McNifolo that that was the final word. There was no way he was going to let Donald Trump at the last minute try to give the closing again. But it came up again because at the end, when Chris Keis was done with his kind of walking through why there was no evidence, their, their, their major argument, which I've seen five times now because they filed four, four or five different motions to – dismiss the case as a directed verdict, directed judgment. You know, Michael Cohen helped us. We win. Yeah. You know, they kept jumping up and down. We've seen these arguments before. They've been rejected time and time again by the judge. The major argument is as, as the, um, as mock, <clears throat> pardon me, as mockingly presented by the New York attorney general, uh, in their office, they said, um, their entire defense boils down to, Donald Trump's a rich guy and banks like rich guys. And they gave him a lot of money. And they didn't look at any documentation uh, or, or any representations that he made under oath in, in lending him money. He just went into a bank and they, they just sent him to the vault and let him take out all the money that he wanted. That's basically their argument. Ignore the, that banks at his level of borrowing don't look at um, statements of financial condition or audited financial statements that were manipulated and cooked by Donald Trump using the outside auditor, but not giving them all the information. I mean, you can you can cook your books with an auditor, Alina Haba, by not providing the auditor with full and complete access. I mean, every public company that's ever gone down for fraud had an outside auditor, many of which are no longer around anymore, like Mazur soon, because they got into bed with their client and didn't do their proper control duty to the public. Um, so that whole argument just shows you how juvenile and how they don't understand how business works in America. The fact that, well, he, he needed outside auditors because banks would not have accepted Alan Weisselberg, who admitted he's not a certified public accountant, but was serving in the role as the chief financial officer just to provide him whatever on the back of an envelope and say, here, uh, banks are funny that way underwriting departments and banks making loans are funny that way. They have a little concept called due diligence and somebody's going to get fired if when they open the file on the audit committee or the loan committee and all they see is a napkin filled out by Alan Weisselberg. There's got to be like, where is your statement of financial condition? Where is your audited financials? Obviously, they relied on it. There was we there was testimony, as they pointed out in the closing, that Deutsche Bank, the main lender for Donald Trump, required a certain amount of liquidity, cash on hand by Donald Trump as part of his assets, not just all the real estate money he could actually, you know, without having a fire sale, everything he could actually stroke a check for if he defaulted. And his net worth had to be at a cer- certain level. And that's where the cooking of the books and the pumping up of the numbers came in. And that's the focus. This is, talk about, you know, to paraphrase Alina Haba, they're not in the real world. They're the, the Trump, they're talking about gaslighting. The Trump people are not in the real world. They're not in a business world. They're not in a commercial world. They're not in a banking world. And they're not in a world where evidence and facts matter. And so when the New York Attorney General was putting on their closing, it was referenced to all of the testimony, both inside the Trump organization not just Michael Cohen, others. 
Alan Weisselberg's statements against his own interest, Trump's own statements against his own interest, where he said, I looked at the statement of financial conditions I, 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 and I, I would make comments on them, meaning he put his hands on them, the ones that were used and relied on by the banks with the Cook numbers, statements made by people at different levels of the organization, you know, the flies on the wall in the finance department and the control department, you know, that Donald Trump couldn't even remember their names during deposition. They killed him in terms of their testimony about conversations they had with Alan Weisselberg and Michael Cohen about pumping up the numbers and, and cooking the books. And pieces of evidence, thousands of pieces of evidence and documents and handwritten notes by, by you know, the controller of the company, uh, uh, Jeff McCon, you know, McConney, you know, in which he, he said, DJT told me to do this, pump up this number. Should we be putting this on our financial statements? These are deals that haven't happened yet. Yes or no, in writing, the marginalia, we like to call it, on the side of the document. Right. That's the evidence. So when people hear that Donald Trump lost five hundred million dollars, people on our audience, I don't want you to think it's because the judge liked Letitia James or something. It's because he has been the fact finder for the 11 weeks of trial with Donald Trump having ample opportunity to defend himself. And he came up with nothing more, frankly, than four experts who were completely rejected by the judge rightly because they had no information that would help the judge determine whether fraud had been committed or the level of damage or disgorgement that was in place. Um, they were all hired guns, and I'm, I'm being polite. The judge went further and said, you can pay a person anything to say anything in dismissing one of the experts. And that left Donald Trump with what? Uh, Don Jr. giving a tour of the family history, starting with, you know, you know, uh, the grandpappy Trump running brothels, which apparently is what happened, all the way to Fred Trump leaving a half a billion dollars to his son in 1999 to start off his career. So that wasn't helpful to the, 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 the issues that are at stake. Did Donald Trump use cooked statements of financial condition and use that with counterparties in order to get loans approved, deals approved, transactions approved, tax breaks, insurance breaks. Did he or didn't he? It's binary. And we know where the judge is at because he's already found twice that there's been persistent fraud in the company. Now it, now we're just down to like, you know, the dust settling and how big of a number for disgorgement. And to, and to correct Chris Keis, it's not damages. He keeps talking about damages in the closing. It drove me nuts. It's disgorgement. It is the ill-gotten money that somebody obtains from doing something fraudulent, where they take the playing field and they tilt it to their advantage, and all that money that comes in their direction, that's what gets ripped away from them and clawed back in a disgorgement proceeding, and that money doesn't go to Letitia James. It goes to the people of the state of New York who have been defrauded by Donald Trump and his, and his ilk in a crime spree, a fraudulent crime spree over the last decade or more. Think about what Donald Trump's defenses are across all of his cases. So you heard Alina Habba say, if you write it down, it can't be fraud. What was their other argument here? That they had a worthless clause, that you could commit all of this fraud, but if you had a worthless clause, it makes all of your agreements. It makes your word, right? I, I grew up and my, and my pop said to me, Ben, be a man of your word. That's what I was taught growing up. Be a person of your word. Well, Donald Trump views it. If I have a worthless clause, then my word doesn't matter. I could defraud you, which is, of course, not what the law allows, nor does his disclaimer, which he refers to as a worthless clause, allow any of that conduct. So it can't be in writing. What, what about if it's oral? What about if you speak it? Well, then he has a First Amendment right, he argues, to say anything. And he can't commit crimes if you engage in speech, according to Donald Trump, because he has an absolute First Amendment right to say anything, he argues. Um, and then when it comes to the 14th Amendment, Section 3 case disqualification, what does Donald Trump argue? I never even took the oath. I never took the oath to support the United States Constitution. And what does Donald Trump argue about trying to overthrow the results of a free and fair election? I have absolute presidential immunity. I can do whatever I want. 
So going back to the first thing we talked about, the E. Jean Carroll case, when Donald Trump talked about his proclivity for sexually abusing women, he said that when you're rich and famous, you can do whatever you want to do. And they just let you do it and you get away with it. Donald Trump has transmuted his abusive behavior as a defense across everything that he does. And as we talk about the cases, these are not arguments that I didn't do it. And that's what the New York Attorney General lawyer said. You didn't hear any evidence that these numbers were accurate. You never heard any evidence that these numbers were the correct numbers. All you heard about was worthless clause or come on, he just made a mistake. Uh, he, he didn't mean to do it. Or so what? This is what goes down all the time. This is just how rich men do business, which is not the case. And so I think it's important that we frame it and talk about it, how Donald Trump is making excuse after excuse after excuse. And what we talk about on the show and what these prosecutors stand for and what our system stands for is law and order. We're going to get to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals argument right now where Donald Trump's lawyers literally argued that Donald Trump should be able to use the Navy SEALs, SEAL Team 6, to kill political opponents and then receive absolute immunity. And Donald Trump, when he gave a press conference later in the week, agreed with that statement. Of course he did. He was the one who told his lawyer to argue that. And his lawyers fell right into a trap that was set by the three-judge panel in the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals because they went right to the heart of, so are you really arguing that he can do this? Right away, the judges went there. And Trump's lawyer, because this is what Trump believes, had no argument other than to, he tried to weasel out of it. But basically he said, yeah, yeah, that's 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 kind of what we believe. We'll talk about that and more. Let's take our last quick break of the day. Do you ever feel like money is just flying out of your account? You have no idea where it's going? I know that feeling. It's all the subscriptions. Think about it. Between streaming services, fitness apps, delivery services, parenting apps, it's endless. I'm guilty of it. So I use Rocket Money to help me find out what subscriptions I'm actually spending money on, and I had them cancel the ones I didn't want anymore. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. I never have to get on the phone with customer service. They'll even try to get you a refund for the last couple of months of wasted money and negotiate to lower your bills for you by up to 20%. All you have to do is take a picture of your bill and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash legal AF. That's rocketmoney.com slash legal AF. Rocketmoney.com slash legal AF. Have you ever wondered why laundry detergent comes in massive plastic jugs? They're heavy, messy, and hard to store. Worst of all, 91% of plastic doesn't get recycled, leaving laundry jugs to sit in landfills for centuries to come. I wanted to ditch the jug. Fortunately, I found a solution, Earth Breeze. Imagine for a moment, something that looks like a dryer sheet, but it actually replaces that cup of goo. A pre-measured liquidless laundry detergent sheet that dissolves in all wash cycles, hot or cold. No measuring, no mess, and no heavy lifting. That's right, no plastic jug. Earth Breeze is my new favorite detergent. The packaging is a cardboard envelope that saves so much space. I can fit 720 loads of sheets where I used to fit one 60 load detergent jug. And I didn't realize how itchy old fashioned detergent made me. But Earth Breeze is dermatologist tested and I truly feel the difference. I signed up for their subscription immediately. I love that it's delivered with free carbon offset shipping right when I need it. I have full control to adjust, pause, or cancel the subscription without hidden fees or penalties. I'm happy to never walk down a plastic-filled laundry aisle again. Most importantly, I still get a powerful clean. Earth Breeze is tough on stains, fights odors, and my clothes come out clean every time. Now, this is what really convinced me. With every purchase, Earth Breeze donates 10 loads of detergent to a charitable cause of your choice. Over 100 million loads have been donated. Now, every time I do laundry, I get this warm, fuzzy feeling. Join over 2 million Americans making a difference with Earth Breeze. 
If you're still not convinced, they offer a 100% satisfaction guarantee. If you don't like it, you'll get a full refund. No questions asked and no return necessary. Trust me, there is no reason not to switch. Right now, my listeners can subscribe to EarthBreeze and save 40%. Go to earthbreeze.com slash legalaf to get started. That's earthbreeze.com slash legalaf for 40% off. earthbreeze.com slash legalaf. We are back live on Legal AF. Check out all those pro-democracy sponsors. Jordy here at the Midas Touch Network goes and does the vetting for these uh, sponsors. We do not allow anybody to advertise on our show. We're very proud of our pro-democracy sponsors. So check it out. The discount codes uh, are in the descriptions. You can see the links below. And so check out those sponsors and uh, we appreciate them for uh, helping to support the pro-democracy content we put on here. Let me set the stage for this DC Circuit Court of Appeals oral argument for you, Popak, and I'll let you take the lion's share of this one. As you know, I'm a geek when it comes to the classified information procedures. <laughs> I'm, I'm angling for a very dorky finale on some SEPA analysis that I, I know everybody's going to be just just <laughs> waiting just waiting for that micellar sepa analysis but um but popak we had donald trump's motion to dismiss uh the indictment before judge tanya chutkin was denied by judge tanya chutkin uh, donald trump argued for absolute presidential immunity as to claiming that all of his conduct that's alleged in special counsel jack smith's criminal indictment about trump's to attempt to overthrow the results of the 2020 election constitute official acts that trump says fall within the outer perimeter of his official responsibilities under article two of the constitution when he was in office even to try to overthrow the results of a free and fair election judge chutkin rejected the very notion that this concept of absolute presidential immunity uh, exists to immunize uh, crimes committed by former uh, presidents while they were in office. Donald Trump filed an appeal to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. They expedited the briefing. At the same time, Special Counsel Jack Smith filed a direct uh, request with the a United States Supreme Court that it skipped the, the it skipped the appeals court. It goes past the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals and goes directly to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court rejected that, I think, in large part because there was an expedited briefing schedule before the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, where oral argument took place on January 9th. It was a three judge panel. One judge was Judge Henderson, who was uh, appointed by Reagan, and then George W. Bush, and then you had. Uh, uh, Judge Pan and Judge Childs, um, appointed by Democratic administrations, and 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 Judge Pan and uh, Childs elevated to the uh, positions right now in the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, I believe, both by President Biden. Um, and so you had a three-judge panel right there. Um, uh, Donald Trump's lawyers arguing for absolute presidential immunity, and the judges got into it right away. I think on two issues, Popak first the issue of jurisdiction. And we've been talking about this amicus brief that was submitted by uh, a group called American Oversight. An amicus brief is a third party friends of the court brief that is submitted by parties, the, the courts of appeals and Supreme Court. They don't have to accept these outside briefs. And when they accept it, it doesn't mean they have to rely on it, but it means they're going to read it and it could help inform them on issues that the parties didn't brief. So there was an issue about whether there was even jurisdiction in the first place. A lot of time was spent on this jurisdiction issue uh, about whether Donald Trump even had the right to bring this appeal on the issue of absolute yeah. presidential immunity at this stage. And then it got to the issue of merits on absolute presidential immunity. So Popak, take it away. As I thought, Judge Penn was the leader of this panel. Um, Florence Penn, remarkable um, credentials, as they all do. But she, she in particular, remarkable credentials. I made a mistake. I said she was Filipino-American. She's Taiwanese-American. I had a friend of the show reach out to me who's also Taiwanese-American say they're very proud of Judge Pan, and we all should be. 
started out working. She worked in Goldman Sachs as an analyst. She worked in the, uh, the Department of the Treasury. She's worked as a U.S. attorney. She was the head of the appellate division for the U.S. Attorney's Office in the District of Columbia. She was elevated from Superior Court judge in the District of Columbia. She then became a uh, D.C. Circuit Court judge under Biden and quickly elevated to the D.C. Court of Appeals. That's a Oh, we're talking about a rocket docket. That is a rocket career trajectory. And I wouldn't be surprised if Biden gets and when he gets another opportunity to put somebody on the Supreme Court if she's not on the short list. Judge Childs is uh, another person who was on the short list for the United States Supreme Court. She was pushed by Lindsey Graham. She came out of South Carolina originally. Um, and she lost out, if, if you're going to call it that, to Ketanji Brown Jackson. Judge Henderson as you said, was appointed by G.W. Bush. But they all they all are aligned in how they grilled the lawyer John Sauer for, um, for uh, Donald Trump, who did not do a very good job because he couldn't answer, refused to answer the most basic questions that are implicated by his legal arguments. The problem they had from the very beginning is they threw everything against the wall in their briefing, hoping something would stick. But many of the things they threw against the wall are internally inconsistent with each other. And so if you're going to argue, for instance, and you're going to spend a considerable amount of time in your argument and in your briefing, in order for there to be a criminal prosecution at all of a former, now former president, there needed to be an impeachment process in the House first. A complete misreading of the impeachment clause in the Constitution about what is required. In fact, you, you'd have, you have to just ignore basic principles of reasonable reading and comprehension in order to come away with the conclusion that if a person is impeached, and uh, which Donald Trump was for elements of Jan 6, not the entire focus of the, of the Jan 6 prosecution in the District of Columbia, but elements of it, but was not convicted, obviously, by the Senate because, A, there was no time, and B, people like Lindsey Graham, uh, I'm sorry, people like Mitch McConnell is on record as saying, we're not going to have a lot of time here because he's already not no longer a president, but there's a criminal justice system out there that will take care of the rest. And People voted accordingly and said, yeah, we don't want to convict the guy. He's an ex-president. Let, let, let the court system handle it. And then when the court system tried to handle it, Donald Trump says, aha, I needed to be convicted by the Senate. And if I wasn't convicted by the Senate, you can't take me out in an indictment in real world criminal justice land. Wrong. But that right along, the fact that they doubled down on that, instead of focusing on some, uh, look, all their arguments are weak. But some were weaker than others. That was, I thought, the weakest of all of their ludicrous arguments. I, if I were them, well, if I were them, I wouldn't have brought this case. But if I were them, I would have leaned in on some of the other arguments having to do with you know, just constitutional analysis of why public policy, you don't want presidents and who are now ex-presidents to be criminally indicted and just stretch the scope of the job description and powers of the presidency. Just stretch it out as far as you can to say that everything that Donald Trump is being indicted for falls within one of the categories of something that's legitimate and therefore he shouldn't be indicted. Chilling effect on the presidency, whatever. By the way, none of that got bought by any of the panelists and led by Judge Pan, but it would have been a better place to be than where he ended up. Right out of the get-go, it was led by, I think each of them had, each of the three judges had concerns, and they kind of led on different topics. Henderson was concerned about kind of the scope of the presidential uh off the official office and the powers of it, what was ministerial and what was official. And, and you know, maybe we should send it back to Judge Chutkin to figure it out. And going back to Marbury versus Madison from 1803, and, and which is a leading preeminent case that we all, a foundational case about the role of the United States Supreme Court as a co-equal branch of government. But um, that, so she was, that was interesting. I didn't, but that really didn't drive, that wasn't the driver for the the hour and a half roasting of John Sauer. Um, it was really child's out of the box about the jurisdictional brief, as you said, filed by friends of the court. In other words, the parties didn't brief this issue about whether the court had jurisdiction or not. This was raised by an outside group that was allowed to submit a brief and the judges found it interesting and asked the parties to be ready, to be prepared so that nobody was caught flat-footed about this argument. And the argument is as follows. There are certain things... There are certain limited things that you're allowed to appeal during the course of a case. Everything else, 
virtually everything else has to be done at the end of the case. Things that are allowed on discretion or otherwise are called interlocutory appeals. Those are appeals that happen before the end of the case. So there's an argument that this type of immunity is found nowhere in the express language of the Constitution. I defy anybody on the other side of the aisle to go through the United States Constitution and tell me where there is language literally written in with the quill on the parchment by the drafters of that particular provision or those provisions that say the president of the United States has immunity from criminal prosecution for anything he did while he was in office. It's relatively easy to write. I just wrote it. It's not there. There, it, there is, by contrast, when the drafters and the framers wanted to include immunity, they knew how to do it because they wrote it in for certain types of, certain classes of people within the government. Speech and debate immunity. If you're a, a member of Congress and you do things within the, the course and scope of what you're been paid to do in Washington, which is to legislate, fact find, investigate, you know, reporting around that and, 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 and actions that are consistent with your role as a legislator, you're not going to get criminally prosecuted or have to or have to respond to criminal process as a result. They wanted to do that. They, it's self-preservation provision, if you will. People that wrote it were all legislators and they wanted to protect themselves. The second one is um, double jeopardy. You know, it, and this is why this is how they try to get in there, shoehorn it in with Donald Trump's people. You know, that's another type of immunity that if you've already been tried for the exact same crime, you're you're not to be tried again, and you don't have to wait till the end of the trial to find out what happens. We'll allow we'll allow an interlocutory appeal, but that's really it, and it has to be written in the Constitution. That's their problem. It's not written in the Constitution for the Trump side. It's it it was created through. You know, case law. You know, we know what happens to case law in the hands of this particular Supreme Court and precedent. We know what happens there. Um, you know, coming down a long line for 237 years about, and, and, and the problem with John Sauer also and his arguments for Trump is that they ignore the leading cases that even have Trump's name on it from 2020 that kind of get to the water's edge of the issue of criminal process and prosecution of a sitting president. In that case is the Vance, Cy Vance, the Manhattan district attorney at the time versus Donald Trump about his tax returns. So there is some precedent that stacks on other precedent about civil liability and immunity that you could argue from, but they just throw that out completely. That's not the toolbox that John Sauer wants to use in making his argument. So the jurisdictional argument is, we have no jurisdiction to hear this matter because this is interlocutory about an issue that's not immune by way of the written word of the Constitution. Goodbye, there's the door. And so Judge Childs led on that. Why are we here? Which I've always told my, my, uh, my uh, colleagues who I trained for trial practice that judges have two questions in their head and they're tapping their foot waiting for a response as soon as you enter the courtroom, which is why are you here and what do you want? And here is the existential, why are we here? And so I gave a lot of credit to the, to the uh, Department of Justice um, uh, lawyer, James Pierce, who argued for uh, Jack Smith. He said, we understand the jurisdictional argument. We didn't make it on purpose. It's not like we missed it. We just think for justice, given the, 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 pres the ex-president being the stakes of the issue having to be resolved, that you should assert uh, at least uh, what we call uh, artificial or temporary or substitute jurisdiction now and make the ruling on the merits. We don't want a technical win, in other words. We understand if you find no jurisdiction, we'll get this case maybe restarted relatively quickly, which is what, of course, the accusation is across the aisle, which is he, they're rushing to judgment. They're, they just want to tear him down, Trump, before the election. And here was an opportunity where he could have just said, that's a great idea. Juris no jurisdiction. Why are we here? Let's go back to Judge Chutkin and the trial court. But but Pierce, being a man of honor and a lawyer, an officer of the court, said, we don't think that's the right way. And we think you have the ability to issue a ruling on the merits. And Judge Pan sort of jumped in with that and said, yeah, I understand the, that we could as long as it's not a fundamental Article Three jurisdictional issue. We can do that. And so then the entire focus was on Judge Pan. <laughs> and so once we were in jurisdiction, it was Judge Pan. And Judge Pan wanted to, as all, and you and I talked about this, all appellate judges, trial judges do it too, but appellate judges are notorious for taking an example to stretch the limits of your position to see 
A, to test it, to give it an acid bath, to see if it, if, it, if it works, and to see how you will navigate around an obvious implication of what you're arguing. And the obvious implication of what John Sauer was arguing is, let me give you, this is, yeah, let me give you an example. I hear you. You agree with me that there may be certain conduct, for instance, that may be official. He's allowed to do it technically. He's commander in chief. But um, assume this for a moment. Commander in chief president orders SEAL Team 6 while he's president to give the order, he gives the order to take out a political rival. But there's no time or there's procedural, you understand, it takes a while to do an impeachment process and a, and, a, and a Senate conviction, or maybe it's in the waning days of an administration where there's no time, last five minutes of a presidency where there's no time. And you're saying that what? That immunity, you want absolute immunity because there wasn't enough time to do the impeachment and the, and the Senate conviction? What are you saying? And he said, yes. There has, well, first of all, that kind of president would be immediately impeached and uh, and convicted by the Senate. But what if he wasn't, Judge Pan said? What if there wasn't enough time to do that? Or for some reason, political or otherwise, the Senate didn't convict him? Are you saying that that type of president that just gave that order would be able to go scot-free? Yes or no? And he said, well, conditional yes. And Judge Pan said, no, no, not conditional yes. Yes or no. Under your absolute immunity theory, does that type of president get uh, avoid criminal prosecution in the justice system. He said, yeah, I'll put you down for yes, maybe, or no, basically was the answer to that. And so when that was going on, all of us on Legal AF were texting each other because we were listening to the oral argument and you and I jumped did a hot take on it. And we all said, oh, that was it. That was the moment where John Sauer didn't just shoot himself in the foot. He shot himself in the argument in the head, no pun intended. And she was a sniper. <laughs> she took him out on that question and he never recovered. And I would, so that went on for a while, the limits of that argument. And she even reminded him, um, as Jack Smith had pointed out in the brief, for instance, Judge Pan also took him the task and said, well, if you go to the congressional record, <laughs> I can see where he's probably, his, his heart was sinking at that moment. Um, there was a position that Donald Trump took at that time and his lawyers took at that time, that the criminal justice system can handle a president like that, be, even if they, even if he doesn't get impeached and convicted. And that was a position that your client took then, that's now inconsistent with the position he's taking now. And senators and other people relied on that position in order not to vote to convict him, didn't they? And so, okay, that was the uh, uh, hour and a half. Uh, James Pierce did great. Uh, in terms of his arguments, and now we're just waiting, literally. I mean, it could come out any any moment now. We're waiting for the order from the D.C. Court of Appeals, which is going to find, I'm sure, and I want to hear your view on it, Ben, that, that any president like Donald Trump, who's been indicted for the allegations and the crimes that he's been indicted for, are going to stand for, stand for justice and trial in the regular criminal court system. All the rest of the arguments that were in the briefs that we heard about, First Amendment, it was a First Amendment right, all went by the wayside. It all came down to jurisdiction and his impeachment clause thing, and then that's going to fail, and they're going to rule quickly. And then we're going to see what happens next with the Supreme Court. One last point. We talked about the E. Jean Carroll case earlier in the podcast, and we, as you and I had said earlier, he did not this case is going to trial on Tuesday because Donald Trump elected not to take an appeal to the United States Supreme Court on an emergency basis to find that he had presidential immunity to defame E. Jean Carroll while he was in office. We said there was it was unlikely he was going to try to push that onto the Supreme Court while they're trying to figure out whether he belongs on the ballot, whether his, his indictment charges against him are valid, and whether he has ultimately immunity from criminal prosecution. He wasn't going to, I don't think he was going to like go to the well that often, and he didn't, and that trial starts on Tuesday. Because if he went to the well and had the Supreme Court and said, I need you, Supreme Court, to rule on an emergency basis, on the issue of absolute presidential immunity, it cuts directly against what he argued when special counsel Jack Smith went to the Supreme Court and asked for absolute and said that you should be ruling on this issue of absolute presidential immunity on, on an expedited basis. And it, it does give you some more insight, though, into Donald Trump, though, in terms of what he is ultimately uh, fearing and the calculation that he is making. 
um, that in the E. Jean Carroll case, which is about money, I think Donald Trump in his mind has probably earmarked a judgment against him from somewhere in the range of $10 million on the low end to one hundred and fifty. million. 200 million for a runaway jury on the high end right there, which I think Trump in his own mind says, well, then I'll try to appeal that and then I'll try to delay that. But what I can't do is let this DC case go first. And if I make a blunder, and I think this is, you know, with some of his other lawyers instructing him, this is not an Alina Habba one right here. Um, his other lawyers basically saying, you know, you need to do anything you, you could try to do to delay this DC case from going to, you know, from going to trial. And that should be your priority because you're going to lose this DC case and that's going to put you in jail for the rest of your life. So that's kind of the chess moves taking place behind the scenes. And, you know, he doesn't have Judge Eileen Cannon in Washington, DC, or Judge Eileen Cannons on the uh, panel that we talked about. And like, you know, there's such a big distinction between a Judge Henderson, right, a judge appointed by a Republican administration from Reagan to George H.W. Bush, whose law and order to what a Trump MAGA judge looks like in Judge Eileen Cannon. And even if people didn't think initially that she was going to be a MAGA judge, and uh, some very wise and brilliant legal scholars thought that Judge Eileen Cannon um, was going to um, exercise some modicum of rationality. Um, she's not. She's not. And as I always say about Judge Cannon, her incompetence is uh, matched and sometimes exceeded by her corruption. And by the way, that's a similar line I give to MAGA, which equals fascism plus idiocracy. And fortunately, the idiocracy far exceeds the ability to implement the fascism at this stage. And there's a, um, a a mix of this with Judge Cannon as well. Like it seems that her goals and objectives are to try to help Donald Trump delay, delay, delay. And at the same time, she's trying to figure out how to do that in a way that positions her case to try to block the other cases the Washington, D.C. criminal case and maybe even the Manhattan District Attorney case, which is scheduled in March. But she doesn't really know how to go about do it. So Cannon keeps on like trying to delay. She knows that if she makes an order that is not the appropriate order um, on any of these issues related to SEPA, the Classified Information Procedures Act, because the statute allows for interlocutory appeal, Unlike the Midland Asphalt decision, where if there is no statute or direct text in the Constitution, like there is none on the issue of absolute presidential immunity, that's why the American Oversight argues there's no interlocutory appeal allowed for Donald Trump on absolute presidential immunity. Jack Smith can appeal on an interlocutory basis from what's called a collateral order, an order that's taken in the middle of a case before trial, before final judgment to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeal. So what we see with Judge Cannon over and over is she doesn't make substantive orders. She masks the substantive orders as scheduling orders because trial judges have almost complete discretion to move dates and that stuff isn't appealable. So when she messes with the calendar and makes rulings that are without prejudice about scheduling, they're not viewed as interlocutor interlocutory appeal issues. So for example, here's what Judge Cannon did with respect to SEPA this past week. She goes, in advance of this upcoming SEPA Section 4 hearing and to assist in the court's evaluation of defendant's motion for access to SEPA Section 4 filings, the court hereby schedules a hearing with the special counsel on January 31st, 2024 at 10 a.m. This hearing shall be conducted on a sealed ex parte basis in a facility suitable for the disclosure of classified information contained in the special counsel section for filings. The court reserves ruling on the defendant's motion for access to SEPA section for filings pending the February 2024 SEPA section for hearings and review of defendants forthcoming SEPA section for challenges. When I look at this, I'm just like, what in the world are you doing, Judge Eileen Cannon? The, the answer is very simple where she says the court reserves ruling on defendants' motions for access to SEPA Section 4 filings. 
in the SEPA world, that's basically elementary school stuff of what's one plus one. And Eileen Cannon here is saying, I reserve the right to determine if one plus one equals four. I'm trying to sort that out. So I want to have a hearing to determine if one plus one equals four. Okay, it doesn't. It equals two. And SEPA section four specifically states that the defendant, Donald Trump, doesn't have access to section four material at the section four ex parte in camera hearing, which takes place just with the judge and just with the prosecutor in a secure facility without the defendant being present. That happens in every SEPA case. It says it in SEPA section four. This is not a complicated, difficult issue, but notice here what Judge Cannon doesn't do. She doesn't say that she is actually allowing Trump's lawyers to show up. Instead, she's saying, I want to hold this pre-hearing, the SEPA pre-hearing. Like, no, just, just follow the rules, Cannon. SEPA section four says you hold the hearing. It's you and the prosecutor. Then you look at the documents. The prosecutor says, these documents are so highly classified that we want to withhold producing these documents and do some sort of substitution or summary and say, these documents involve nuclear codes. These documents involve war plans, but not actually turn over the war plans. And then Judge Cannon, if you think the war plans or nuclear codes or whatever the material the government wants to withhold should be turned over, you order that they be turned over. And then that order gets stayed while Jack Smith or whoever the prosecutor in whatever the case where this statute is invoked, they file an interlocutory appeal to challenge your decision. That's section four in a nutshell. You don't get to say, I want to hold a pre-section four hearing to determine whether or not the defense can participate in the SEPA section four here. They're not allowed to participate, period, end of story. So what is she doing here? She's just trying to screw around with the prosecution. Like it's obvious that what she's doing is she doesn't even know what she's doing. So she's trying to learn on the job because she's never had a SEPA case before in her entire career. And she wants to hear what the prosecution is going to say. So then she can figure out what she's going to try to do. It's exactly what she did back in 2022 when she tried to exercise and did assert equitable jurisdiction over a search warrant that was signed by a magistrate judge. Um, and she asserted jurisdiction over this case to try to block the search warrant from, from being executed. And the 11th Circuit was like, no court ever has exercised equitable jurisdiction in anything like this. You can create some new standards. And she's creating a new extra statutory standard right here that doesn't exist. So that's on that one. And then on Friday, she issued this other notice paperless order. And, and that's why I want you to focus on the subtleties here of what she's doing. Notice paperless order, paperless order. Every word has meaning. And that's why I, I want to focus on, uh, on this that other legal shows don't. Paperless order, denying without prejudice, special counsel's motion to compel disclosure regarding advice of counsel defense. The court has reviewed the motion, defendant's opposition. The special counsel's reply and is fully advised in the premises, assuming the facts and circumstances in this case warrant uh, an order compelling disclosure of an advice of counsel trial defense, the court determines that such a request is not amenable to proper consideration at this juncture. Prior to at least partial resolution of pretrial motions, transmission to defendants of special counsel's exhibit and witness list, and other disclosures as may become necessary. The special counsel's motion is therefore denied without prejudice. So focus on paperless order, denying this motion without prejudice. So she tries to cast this order in a way that can't be appealed on an interlocutory basis, which you now know what that means by special counsel Jack Smith. All Jack Smith is saying is, look, if Trump's going to blame his lawyers, which he claims he may, and throw the lawyers under the bus, that waives Trump's attorney-client privilege. If he's going to say they're the reasons why he willfully retained national defense information that he shouldn't have. And my dog and my dogs are upset about that too. My dogs are very frustrated that that would be the request that Donald Trump would throw uh, his lawyers under the bus. But Jack Smith, very reasonably, Jack Smith, very rationally wants to say, hey, if you're going to make that defense, 
Don't do it at the time of trial because then your waiver of attorney-client privilege and you're going to have to turn over all of these documents and records is going to cause chaos in the trial. So Judge Cannon, just do what every other judge does in this situation. Make them disclose an advice of counsel defense right now or start the process where at least 60 days or so before the trial, they disclose the advice of counsel defense. And then we can all be prepared. Like you should have an orderly scheduling order. And Judge Cannon goes, that's premature. Premature. Your trial date, according to your trial schedules, in four months. It's May 20th, 2024. So why would it be premature to go through the normal steps that we go through? And also it should be noted that Judge Cannon similarly rejected at a in a paperless order, Jack Smith's request under SEPA to set a Section 5 hearing, which is for Trump to disclose the classified information that he wants to inject at trial so the government can protect against blackmailing or gray mailing, which is the whole point and purpose of SEPA, which is to protect against criminal defendants accessing national defense information and extorting the government to dismiss the criminal case against them or else they will make Make these classified documents public and undermine national security. That's why you have the SEPA statute to protect against that. That's why it's so important. That's why courts just follow, uh, follow it per what the statute says. And by the way, these issues were before Judge Chutkin also, because there are classified information in the Washington, D.C. case. You don't hear this even being discussed or debated because Judge Chutkin made one order to Donald Trump's lawyers and said, if you have case law that directly rebuts what SEPA says and what every court has done in this country, please present it to me by date X. They did not. And she said, denied. We're moving on. We're not dealing with this stuff. Popak, that just shows you, though, Judge Eileen Cannon, why judges are so important, why elections matter, because Donald Trump appointed Judge Cannon, and you see the difference between a Cannon type of judge and even a George H.W. Bush judge in a Henderson. It's night and day what, what, what it means now if you're a judge appointed by MAGA versus a judge appointed by a conservative like a Judge Ludding, who I agree with on a lot of issues, yeah. versus this new breed of MAGA judges. Yeah, Judge, yeah, Judge Ludig, we're going to have uh, an illegal AF special. Um, I've, you and I have been corresponding with him to join us, and, and he's looking forward to that. Um, she's been over her skis since day one. I'm a Southern District of Florida regular practitioner. That's a sleepy backwater um, branch of the division of the Southern District of Florida, it, other than drug cases and some other um, immigration type matters, it doesn't get um, things of the magnitude of trying the first president, former president of the United States in a criminal matter related to espionage and obstruction of justice. That goes without saying. Um, but a more um, seasoned, uh, more experienced, um, a more um, sober judge uh, would uh, assign to it, even even one that was as new to the bench as Judge Cannon would be doing a much better job, regardless of the party that appointed them. Um, it's really not, to, to be frank, it's not the right judge in the right court to be handling this. We know why Jack Smith picked Southern District of Florida. He was concerned that if he, even though there were plenty of allegations that tied back to Washington, D.C., uh, the Sixth Amendment requires that the suit be brought and that the jury be picked of appears in the in the the community in which the crimes were committed, and while it could have been an argument that some of the crimes dealing with the National Archive, the interaction with the White House, coming out of the White House with the confidential documents, SEPA documents were done in D.C., it was a stronger case to have it located the situs of it in Florida, and in Southern District of Florida, which runs up and down the East Coast. Problem with that is once you eliminate the senior status judges and the judges that weren't taking any new cases. Um, you were only left with a couple of judges from which to choose. It would have been Middlebrooks, who would have been great, <laughs> so, you know, 25 years on the bench, sophisticated commercial litigator in his own right before that, and has stood up to Donald Trump in cases like um, finding that he and Alina Haba a million bucks for that fraudulent, meritless case against uh, Hillary Clinton and the DNC uh, and others for fraud that Donald Trump brought as a campaign 
piece of literature instead of a lawsuit over a year ago. But then I left uh, Aileen Cannon, and I have to believe that Jack Smith knew the risk he was taking and took the risk. I read for you, or I recited a bit of Judge Pan, who, who as uh, Karen Freeman Niffalo said, we have a, a girl crush on uh, on her. I have a boy crush on her. Um, and we, listen, listen to her background. I mean, her background is just uh, the people that Joe Biden is picking to put on uh, on on different panels and filling these these openings, Treasury Department, Goldman Sachs analyst, U.S. attorney, uh, you know, f- judge, uh, you know, just just and then you know, it's Alien Cannon, you know, Federalist Society, short time in a sleepy backwater office of the U.S. Attorney's Office doing appeals. That's all she did. Now you'd think she'd reach out. You know, there's senior judges on the Southern District that are very very good that I know well and I practice in front of. She's just not one of them. And then she compounds it, as you outlined, uh, with being over her skis, with what appears to be a bias or putting her thumb on the scales of justice in favor of Donald Trump, which even the appearance of it is is unsettling and just wrong. I'll do a separate hot take on the second part of your uh your and a breakdown of everything that's going on. The breakdown is the right word in uh, <laughs> you know in uh, the Southern District with Judge Cannon on the lawyers. It's this is much to about nothing. There is no way on God's green earth that Donald Trump is going to be able to use any argument that he relied on the advice of counsel to obstruct justice, to hide the documents, to not provide them to the National Archives, to not properly respond to the subpoena, and to try to uh, burn, drown, or otherwise get rid of and erase the uh, video recordings of him telling his henchmen to move the boxes away from his own lawyers and ultimately from and hide them from federal judges in the Department of Justice. He's not going to be able to rely on that. I'm going to do the hot take where I'm going to go over very carefully Evan Corcoran in his cooperation with the U.S. attorney and what he has told Jack Smith and the U.S. attorney about his advice and what happened during the logistics of him searching and what Donald Trump told him about pulling out documents and just losing them conveniently at the hotel that he was staying in before he met with the lead lawyers for the Department of Justice, Christina Bob, no better, and Alex Cannon, who will ultimately testify that Donald Trump told him to tell the National Archive that he had completed and fully produced everything that was responsive to the request when that was not true. And then finally, Jennifer Little, who's going to testify because she's already told the, the Department of Justice that she told Donald Trump to stop screwing around with the subpoena. Now that the subpoena had been issued, this was his moment to turn over all the documents or face criminal conviction. These are not the kind of lawyers that you'd be able to rely on for a a defense of counsel uh, defense, which is very difficult to do anyway. You have to thread a tremendous needle, uh, a tremendously small needle, in order to get it. You have to have asked for certain advice that's completely consistent with the conduct that you're being charged with. You have to have obtained that advice, having given full and complete information to the lawyers. The lawyer's advice has to be followed to a T. And then upon that, you may have a common law defense to an indictment. None of that's going to be relevant here. So we're just playing This is just uh, effery of the first degree because he's never going to be able to rely on that. And I don't know why she's not allowing uh, Jack Smith to call it out now the way he called it out in the District of Columbia with Judge Chutkin early and often. You know, he's just responding, the Jack Smith side of the equation, is just responding to the the, uh, uh, comments that are made outside the courtroom, the extra judicial comments made by Donald Trump and his lawyers on talk shows and at rallies that they're going to rely on the advice of counsel. So he equally wanted that called out. Now, if that's true, let's get to the bottom of it and let's brief it. And and I want to know about it now because she's not really ready to try her case in May. And all indications are that ain't going to happen despite the fact it's still on the docket because she's not doing any of the things that are required preliminarily to get the case live up for May. Trials don't, I'm in the trial, I just finished the trial yesterday. Trials don't just happen. Like you don't just show up on trial day and uh, hi everybody, I'm here for the trial. That's not how trials work. There's preliminary pre-trial activities, civil cases and criminal cases and deadlines that have to be met and discovery that has to be obtained and exchanged and depositions if you're in civil case. And all of these things have to happen in 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 an order 
without delay and on a set schedule that's been enforced by a judge. We have none of that here, which is why I'm back to your original position that I fought for a while because, you know, I'm a member of the bar down there, um, is that is that she's doing it on purpose as opposed to just being incompetent. And it, it, it just, at this point, her she has to know about the criticism that's been lodged at her. I'm sure she's talked to, or if not, she's dumber than, we're, than we think, talked to senior uh, people in her kitchen cabinet, senior judges, including Judge uh, uh, Ungaro, who's the senior judge for the Southern District of Florida down in Miami, about how to handle things. Judges reach out to other judges, or they're, they're supposed to, and have that conversation over a tuna fish sandwich. And I don't think she's doing that, because if she's doing it, who's giving her this terrible, terrible advice? So, and if she's not doing it, she's not doing it on purpose, because she wants to be the one judge that seems to be on in favor of Donald Trump, against all other odds. Courts of appeals, federal judges, state judges, not one of them thinks that Donald Trump is a credible, uh, trustworthy participant in either of the court systems, federal or, or state, uh, criminal or civil, uh, except apparently Aileen Cannon, who, who bends over backwards to credit Donald Trump's lawyers and give them the benefit of every doubt and tie to every runner on every issue, which only is going to result in, sorry, folks, can't do May. We're not really prepared, are we? No, because you didn't allow us to be pre- you didn't allow us to be prepared. And Popak, I think it's even worse than that. I mean, I think what her plan is is that she's going to try to, I think, dismiss the case, which actually may end up being a good thing because it'll be immediately appealable to the Eleventh Circuit Court of Appeals. That's going to reverse her. I expect her to make the worst rulings, and when she does. Then that's when the 11th Circuit can step in and potentially remove her at that time and reverse her. And there is case law in the 11th Circuit that there's like a three strikes rule in some of the other cases where they previously have removed a judge. But if I look at the schedule coming up and I impute the worst motives to Judge Cannon, which I don't know why I wouldn't at this stage, we have... Defense motions to compel discovery coming up on January 16th. We got defense challenges to Section 4 motions on January 23rd. We have a hearing on the Section 4 motions mid-February. Then you have the pre-trial motions scheduled on February 22nd. You have a scheduling conference on March 1 with that May trial date remaining in place. I expect Judge Cannon to rule. I mean, she's going to have to rule on these motions. And look, the, she's been dealing with these SEPA issues, Popak, for what, nine months now, it seems? Eight, eight months dealing with very basic SEPA issues that could probably have been dealt with in, in less than a week. It's taken her. So what is she going to do when she gets the absolute presidential immunity argument that Trump claims that because he was a classifying and declassifying source while he was in office, those powers impute to him even when he leaves the office. You know he's going to make an argument like that. What does she do when he makes the argument of prosecutorial misconduct and says that uh, uh, Jack Smith breached attorney-client privilege and seized all of these documents despite the fact that that's not what took place and you actually had a Washington, D.C. grand jury um, that was impaneled and you had a Washington, D.C. federal judge make the orders and Judge Beryl Howell and and Boesberg, um, you know, who are the ones who are involved in making kind of important orders in this and other cases. What do you think she does? Let me ask you this, Popak. What do you think she does if she was sitting where Judge Chutkin was and she got Donald Trump's absolute presidential immunity argument? Do you have any doubt that she would have granted absolute presidential immunity? Do you have any doubt that she would when she would be given the arguments about SEAL Team 6, I can tell you why she would grant absolute immunity because she exercised equitable jurisdiction over the search warrant and she said that special rules apply to Donald Trump that don't apply to anybody else. So she's already applying that standard. But why I want to tell everybody, one, that will be bad, but why I actually think it's actually a good thing that that's going to happen. I want to 
I want to both create a, a sense of the reality of what's going to happen, but then let you all know why I actually think that that's not a horrible thing to happen for real is because she's going to have to make ruling soon. This paperless order crap can't go well, on. Let me forever. interrupt since she asked me a question. I didn't get a chance to answer. Let me ask you a question that I yeah. want you to answer. You said she's going to dismiss it. What's the grounds to dismiss the indictment? based on the um, Espionage Act and the obstruction of justice based on the facts alleged in the indictment. Under what grounds would you dismiss it? You're, you're thinking like a logical lawyer, and I I'm think trying that's- trying to be a lawyer. And, and, and that's where you miss the mark on the question, although <laughs> it, it's a fair one. She will find, I believe, whether it's absolute presidential immunity, some claim that because Trump was a declassifying authority while he was in office, that that imputes to something in the future. She'll try to find that She'll try to find that there was prosecutorial misconduct here and, and an overreach. I just have a hard time believing that this judge who has made the exact wrong rulings every time she's been confronted with a ruling will now make the correct ruling so, when she is when she is presented. So if you're right, if you're right, let's just play it out, play out the thought the thought game here. Why hasn't the lawyers uh, for, um, or when will the lawyers for Donald Trump file such a motion to require her to have it ruled upon? They did it late in the game for Chutkin to maximize collateral damage and try to take out the trial date. They could have filed that same set of motions early on in the indictment because nothing in it was based on new information that they obtained in discovery process. They just wanted to wait until the last possible moment in order to F with the trial date. So why haven't they done it here? Same exact reason. Yeah, they're they, waiting. Mm -hmm. They're waiting. And the more they can delay it, it's a twofer for the Trump team delay it as long as possible. And then finally, when Judge Cannon does whatever she's going to do with it, um, it you know, it, it'll, it'll either be delayed so much that it won't happen before the election or, um, you know, or she'll, you know, grant or, or she'll grant a dismissal. But here's the thing I want to let everybody know. This is not double jeopardy. Trump doesn't just get off if that's what happens. That would get appealed to the 11th Circuit, which would very swiftly and immediately reverse what Judge Cannon does. And, and again, I, I just, you're right, Popak, all of the law suggests everything that she says, there is no basis to dismiss this case. So I hope that I'm wrong when it comes to Judge Cannon, but everything, every data point that I have about her tells me that whether it's granting a motion to dismiss or finding that the prosecution engaged in some uh, discovery abuse that will allow her to do something, I think that we will have one of those things um, take place. And I think the headline will be initially kind of bad and everyone's going to react a certain way. But ultimately, Jack Smith will take very soon an expedited appeal to the 11th Circuit Court. They're going to reverse her. The question is, is on what order is that? When does she make the order? Is it a SEPA Section 4 order that maybe Jack Smith goes first before any of that stuff can happen and then gets her reversed? Is it another discovery order that she makes and then Jack Smith can finally go to the 11th Circuit? Jack Smith has diligently filed all of these things. She hasn't ruled on anything. But to everybody wondering, well, you know, this is not great with Judge Cannon. I actually think that if you play it out, the repercussions will happen to Judge Cannon in due course. I do. And where I'm still not worried at all is I think your Washington, D.C. case, which is on an expedited basis, is, you know, is, is on track for that trial to take place still in 2024. You have the Manhattan District Attorney case that will occur in 2024. You will have Donald Trump as a convicted felon because he's committed felonies in 2024. You have Donald Trump by February 1. He's going to be hit with somewhere in the range of $250 million to $500 million in judgments, not just in 2024, but in the, mar in the month of February, that will be taking place. 
And in the next week or two, we will learn that Donald Trump lost before the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, and he will continue to lose these cases. So I just want to paint an accurate picture for everybody here on everything that's going on and where I have concerns, where I don't have concerns, where Popak has concerns, where I don't, but where I think this nets out as we know justice moves the way it does. And that's why, as we started the show, talking about what was going on in the New York Attorney General civil fraud case, how that investigation reached a closing argument, and now there will be justice served there. So, you know, look, a lot going on. Michael Popak, appreciate spending this weekend with you. It's always a pleasure. I want to give a special thanks to Salty, of course, um, for all of the great work he does behind the scenes and our entire team here. And thank you all to the Midas Mighty. We appreciate all of you so much. We're grateful for you, and we will talk with you soon. We'll see you soon. Legal AFers, you're the best. Shout out to the Midas Mighty. Mighty.